yeah, we're getting somewhere. I finished the board. Um, Yeah, again, as you can see from the layout, there is uh, always some distance between heat sources and uh, my electrolytic capacitors. Um, yeah, if, if you want to see <laughs> how I started soldering it, uh, uh, yeah, watch that video. I was a little hiccup with my <laughs> old soldering station, but uh, yeah. Well, it's finished and... Uh, oh. Yeah, there are botched up some traces, but uh, yeah, it turned out okay. I measured a little bit around on the board, uh, if there are any obvious shorts, if uh, all the diodes and stuff survived, and uh, it looks good, and it's time to put it uh, into the case. Uh, not completely connected, just, uh, yeah, connect our... load so that should light up and uh, yeah no, not in focus now uh, that should light up and um, the transformer I will not uh, connect anything else I first want to check if uh, yeah all the rails the positive rail and the negative rail gives the correct voltage I don't want to blow up my nice uh, LN 317k steel uh, regulator because uh, replacing that would be quite expensive. So the board is in. I uh, mounted it using some uh, nylon screws and nuts. That's what I had lying around, and some uh, yeah distance pieces. Um, yeah, transformer, nicely heat shrunk, of course, transformer input. And uh, yeah, that screw terminal should give uh, on that position the uh, rectified and filtered input voltage. And yeah, that's, let's see if that works. And uh, that screw terminal here. Uh, where I have a little wire that should be, um, yeah, um, ground, hopefully. Oh, we still, uh, we have 1.2 volts uh, still in the main filter cap. Uh, that's probably from me uh, you know, measuring the diodes. And um, yeah, our... Uh, indicator light power indicator is in and connected to its screw terminal hopefully the right way around and uh, if I now hit the power button uh, we should see here um, a reasonably voltage with uh, not too much ripple uh, no smoke coming up from the board and the indicator light going on so let's try that Wow, indicator light is working. 35 volts, ripple, 100, 100 milli, okay, it's going down, it's calculating, but uh, with a load of, um, I don't know what I said, a few dozen milliamps uh, for the LEDs, uh, yeah, there really should be no ripple. So, that's really looking good uh, and now I can and the voltage is stable is it yeah it's stable it's not rising I mean it fluctuates a little bit but that's okay that's what we have a regulator for but it's not continuously rising so uh, yeah, the current I draw out of it uh, through my uh, oversized indicator light. Yeah, and yeah, the resistors get re 
reasonably hot. I mean, almost too hot to touch them continuously. But uh, yeah, well, I'm dropping a lot of power there. We'll see how that's working out. Um, ah, just sniffed it a little bit. Um, yeah, and now we can probe around a little bit. For example, this pin here should be the negative voltage. And it says 7.5. minus 7.6 volts that might be okay because that might be okay because uh, I'm currently having absolutely no load on that LM337 negative voltage regulator and without any load, um, I think it needs a few milliamps. Uh, without any load, it won't regulate. But um, yeah, we have a negative voltage there. That's nice compared to ground. And uh, yeah, but um, I should somehow put some load on that thing here. Um, yeah, I have to look at the circuit diagram how to do that without blowing anything off. So um, I put in uh, the 10 turn pot and connected it uh, to the board and um, I bridged the place where the regulator should be with I think a 1.5k resistor and if we go to the circuit diagram uh, so here's our positive rail with the filter cap and uh, the LED load and then we go up here. Here is the temporary 1.5k resistor. Then we go through these resistors, through the pot and through the negative rail. And that should give us uh, maybe not the 12.5 milliamps, but um, yeah, 10, 20 milliamps, whatever, uh, but it should be enough so uh, we could measure the regulated minus 1.2 volts here on this rail. <coughs> okay, I'm currently uh, connected like before to the main power rail, so let's see. Thirty. 35 volts, okay, on the main rail. And on our negative rail, uh, where was that here? 1.267 volts. That's okay. I mean, uh, it's uh, obviously it's. Um, yeah, from the specs between 1.2 and 1.3 volts. Um, that's uh, what your standard LM337 negative or positive LM317 uh, does. And uh, this one is at 1.267 volts. Is the pot getting warm? No, that's good. Oh, yeah, well, dropping quite a voltage here. Uh, is that one getting warm? Yeah, within reason. Okay. Wonderful. And the main voltage should yeah, drop quite quickly while we still have some negative voltage here. And yeah, why that is important, um, I will tell you 
another time. Yep. Um, yeah, some <laughs> curious details um, about how I mounted <laughs> uh, my indicator light. Um, yeah, that was the only M16 by one fine threaded nut I could come by on short notice. And uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> this is not going anywhere, is it? And uh, I also put in, uh, as you can see, the uh, binding posts and yeah, the ground binding post. Uh, I used some washers instead of these isolation sleeves. So uh, yeah, because I mean, it's ground, it uh, doesn't matter. Um, something else. Mm, yeah, I already told you I uh, used here nylon screws, but uh, yeah, that's not going anywhere. So um, I'm a little bit concerned about these resistors getting so hot. I mean, uh, there are two watt types and they are burning uh, each one below one watt, um, but they are still getting hot because the surface is too small. So yeah, a possible enhancement would be to put these thingies um, use real power resistors and put them uh, somewhere on the back. There's still space here. But um, for now, uh, let's put in the regulator, shall we? So I put the heatsink on the back and yeah, looks good. And uh, connected it hopefully correctly up to uh, the screw terminal. So now we should be able to see the regulator in his full glory working or not. When you watched my revamp of these analog uh, meters video, you know I'm <laughs> not staging that beforehand. So let's see. Um, yeah. Oh, huh, 24 volts and going down. Going down, going down, oh, point oh, oh, one, one. That's great. So Give it 10 turns, 24.04 and now I should be able to trim this to 25. Okay, that was the wrong direction obviously. Oh, I should probably Take a screwdriver that fits in here. Wrong direction. Or is it? Oh, that's down. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. Mm. 
good enough. <clears throat> With 10 millivolt ripple. So yeah, the only thing that I'm a little bit concerned about is, uh, yeah. They smell. I mean, they are well within their specification, but uh, they're giving up too much heat. I mean, I can feel it here. Uh, yeah, 220 volts. Uh, I can feel it yeah, here a little bit. Okay, I need another solution for that. Uh, maybe dropping the brunt of the power here somewhere at the back. Uh, yeah, power resistor, Ooh, 220 volts uh, mounted here. But um, yeah, I don't have that part right now. So uh, let's continue with the instruments first. Oh, and uh, another important thing, if I switch off now, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. Uh, the trick is here, your negative rail <laughs> needs to stay up a wee bit longer than your positive rail. Uh, because if you're negative auxiliary rail, um, wait. <clears throat> if your negative rail, uh, the capacitors after disconnecting the power, uh, goes, well, not goes down, goes up to zero before your main capacitor is empty, your output voltage will also jump 1.25 volts up and uh, the, if you're feeding a 3.3 volt uh, digital logic from your power uh, supply and uh, you simply want to switch off and uh, suddenly the voltage jumps off uh, jumps up 1.25 volts, you are at 3.3, uh, 4, 4.5 volt, and uh, that might kill your circuit. So, uh, yeah, something to consider for uh, these voltage doubler charge pump circuits. But yeah, now we have even minus 4. So there's more charge left here than here, but uh, yeah, that's okay. We have no load on it at the moment. So yeah, that's good for now. Getting the instruments in will be the next step. Yeah, the uh, <laughs> uh, focus uh, the meters are in um, um, yeah the range switches only uh, yeah temporarily they are missing some finishing touches um, yeah uh, <laughs> it actually gets quite cramped in here if you put everything in especially uh yeah i had some real trouble uh yeah <clears throat> putting the screws in for <laughs> yeah can you see that in the back uh the binding posts. But anyway, the meters are in and um, we should be able to see something, huh? Let's see. Ah. 
that really in focus? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, could still play a little bit with the calibration, I guess, but uh, forward range. Yeah, nice. But what I still don't like is um, that has to go. These are, can you see that? Oh. To get rid of the test leads. And don't shock myself here on the transformer, but uh, yeah. These thingies here. They're, they're simply getting too hot. Uh, that was not a good idea <coughs> to put them there. I really need another solution for that. And that's the solution. So um, I still have my triple LEDs, but uh, I have now only 100 ohm resistors uh, directly at the LEDs, which will uh, each drop on worst case 90 milliwatts or something. So yeah, that's okay. And uh, the main burden will be taken by uh, that 11 watt <laughs> 1.2K resistor, which yeah, uh, comes uh, Sorry for the shaking. Yeah, I have a spare hole here. Um, that wasn't planned. Uh, there was, uh, I think, the uh, selenium rectifier was mounted there, and uh, I have, uh, yeah, some parts that will uh, form a clamp. And uh, is it? Yeah, I see. It's not mains is not connected that will uh, yeah clamp it here somewhere at the back maybe with some heat conducting goo just for the kicks of it and uh, yeah then I should be fine let's see well that's neatly stowed away now um, first of all that's a great plus uh, the whole assembly just focus the whole assembly of the LEDs and the <laughs> how do I point there uh, fits now in the housing of the indicator light so uh, yeah there's also more clearing between sorry the mains AC stuff and the rest and uh, yeah then you have a long cable going to the back where uh, the resistor is neatly, yeah, you need really a lot of force to move that. That's okay and then it's going around, getting dizzy yet to, uh, yeah, the screw terminal. Let's see if the indicator still lights up, as it should. Yeah, wonderful. Ah, what an, and, and now you can see the three LEDs. It's it's like a little bit like the uh, an illuminated radiation warning sign. I like it. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. Still some, oops, sorry. Desk is getting full, still some stuff to do. <clears throat> still trying to find out how to bend the other side of these 
struts to uh, to the back to a little bit uh, you know that's too wobbly not enough metal left here uh, how to bend them but they fit uh, yeah I will tell you how I do that and um, yeah I need some labels here for the switches and it would be nice if they would be in the same style like that one. Okay, huh. let's go to work. So it's time for me to uh, bend the struts that will go from the switches to the back and I already bent uh, one side. And uh, basically I have here 30 millimeters uh, to go completely around the switch. And now the question is where do I cut it and bend it uh, so it will exactly uh, yeah, fit in the case. If it's too long I have a real problem. I mean I could <laughs> file something down but I have not much to file here, do I? Um, if it's a little too short, it's okay. I shim, could shim something, uh, yeah, in between, uh, washer or whatever. Yeah, mm, I have two approaches to that. Um, the first one, and um, yeah, don't take my word for it, please. I think I mentioned in that video where I built my electronic load uh, that I'm bending metal is not my forte. Uh, but anyway, here it goes. So what we have here, let me zoom in and focus. You have basically a radius of a circle or the circumference of a circle with a certain radius. And uh, how I bent that was um, I simply took the 30 millimeters I need to cover my uh, switch completely and yeah, very primitive. Hold some pliers to that mark. Yeah, mark is still visible. Pliers exactly to the mark and then I bent the whole thing by hand. and. Uh, yeah, turned out okay. So no problem there. But um, as I said, on uh, the back side we need a little bit more precision. So um, we will make a band, and the band should yeah leave us with thirty millimeters, and it should go to the back a certain length. Um, now there's a mathematical formula and you probably remember it from school between the circumference of a circle and its radius and we here over have a fourth of the circumference and that formula is of course uh, circumference is equal to 2 pr. Now I only need a fourth of the circumference so this divided by 4, this with, uh, is PR over 2. And uh, my radius, uh, as I tried to measure it from the existing band, is about 4.5 millimeters. So I have pi, which is 3.14, as you all know, of course, times 4.5, divided by 2 gives 2. 7.1 millimeters. So this here should be 7.1 millimeters. And yeah, if I go straight, this is of course again, yeah, simply turn the dial up here. This is again R. So I have to lengthen the whole thing where I, yeah, where I want it to end. In the case by 
circumference over 4 minus r, which is 2.6 millimeters. Yeah, simply lengthen it by your circumference over 4 minus r. That's basically my delta I have to add. Um, yeah, funny thing is I uh, tried to <laughs> verify that and measure it uh, by actually taking some tape and bending it around and uh, stuff and um, the tape measurements gave me something like, uh, yeah, sorry, scribbling, um, gave me more something like seven millimeters around here and five millimeters from uh, where I measured. So that's a delta of two millimeters I have to lengthen. Um, yeah, of course, the problem here is that, sorry, zooming out again, giving you focus. The problem here is, this is not mathematics. This is mechanical engineering. Uh, if you bend, probably only your most inner material will keep its original length. Your outer material will be stretched and your inner material will be compressed. <sighs> yeah, and if we do an extreme zoom again and focus on it, on focus you can see how the surface here seems to be rough there are small small gaps on the surface that opened up when it was bent and if you look into the inner you can see that the material also looks a little bit funny because it has been compressed. So instead of going with um, the great theory, uh, my theory of bending, um, let's go with the stuff I measured. <laughs> Take two millimeters, maybe even less, because as I said, um, If it's too long and not fitting in, I have a problem. If it's a little too short, uh, I can still shim something in. Okay, I come back to you uh, when I'm done. Well, that didn't went too well. <laughs> yeah, I think the difference or what I had to file down in the end uh, is quite obvious uh, so yeah I should have probably uh, just given 1.5 millimeters and additional millimeters in that direction instead of two um, yeah but uh, now it's a real snug fit from both directions, so. Yeah, there's a little wobble, but uh, this is really minimal. I think I can live with that. Yeah, that's not too bad. I mean, this is anyway our bent here the old metal so yeah I'll make the second one and then I drove them and then we put them in oh yeah um, one thing uh, if you need to put holes into the things 
put uh, where's my focus not quite yeah put the holes in after you bend it because uh, as you bend it your holes will also distort and become ovals and uh, yeah then you have even more to file there you have it the finished products yeah um <clears throat> i had to file down a little bit on the second one too not so much i guess like uh, on the first one but uh, still a little bit to file until it really fits and uh, yeah i guess a third time would be the charm but um yeah there won't be a third strut there are only two struts so uh, let's put them in so the struts are in uh, yeah and the front doesn't wobble anymore well uh, basically there was no metal left around uh, the instruments where the cutouts for the instruments are and this is now really well not rock solid but uh, you know reasonably solid and uh, you don't bend the case anymore if you actuate the switches and uh, yeah very nice and I uh, yeah on a side note I replaced uh, that switch there I I think I mentioned I wanted to replace it. Uh, it was a blue Chinese one. Now it's a black uh, expensive one. And uh, yeah, just a finishing touch because these are metal cases for uh, some isolation shielding uh, here on top of the instrument where uh, the current shunts are. And um, yeah, the current shunts switched through a switch not the brightest of my ideas uh, while for the voltmeter that's totally okay because uh, we are talking here the voltmeter itself has uh, uh, what was it two kilo ohms of internal resistance and uh, yeah the series resistors are dropping the voltage to the instruments at another uh, few dozen 10 kilo ohms or 100 kilo ohms uh, then a few dozen milli ohms plus minus of the switch uh, yeah it does nothing it does nothing i mean we're talking here the instruments it, it, themselves are uh, accuracy 1.5 percent on full scale yeah class 1.5 uh, but with shunts here, uh, with I think the smaller one is 0.07 ohms, and the bigger one uh, is 0.33 ohms. Um, a few dozen milli ohms difference on each switching cycle, or when the switch ages, uh, that's a huge difference. That's a huge difference. And uh, I will have to find, but at another day, uh, another solution for that. But uh, now the struts are in. And as I said, one finishing touch is missing. Yeah, I can see it from the back. That was, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I had re removed temporarily or at least loosened it up. Uh, the heat sink uh, for my LM 317k steel um, to get the screws in yeah if you look about it um, uh, slightly covered by it but uh, that's okay so <sighs> waiting for the finishing touch and then we close it up for good at least for now <laughs> so what's the last touch um well if you take a 
Do you know what that is? That's the slider of a <laughs> uh, three and a half inch floppy disk, if you remember these things. It's very thin sheet metal. And uh, you take a letter stencil and some um, adding or other brand uh, Really, this uh, these are no, uh, not the uh, normal addings. These are the uh, yeah, I don't know what it is, but uh, these are the things uh, you don't use to write on metal. I, I won't write on here. Oh, yeah, I have another one here. You pump them, and then you get out uh, some real paint. So if you put all this together, you can make some really nice labels, usually. Problem here is the smallest adding I found is not quite fitting into these five millimeter hole labels. And so the end product letters and though the end product uh, for now will be something like this um, yeah and i uh, simply cut them out uh, from the thin sheet metal uh, with a uh, yeah. pair of scissors and uh, the hole I made with a paper puncher. Um, yeah, don't, don't try to saw such a thin sheet metal. I think it's aluminum. Uh, or try to drill holes into it, uh, it won't work. You have to cut it and you need uh, a puncher for the holes. Anyway, um, so I did the labeling uh, without a stencil by hand and uh, yeah. Another thing I, if I get bored, I might improve. Uh, I forget, uh, you know, adding with a smaller tip of that type or um, get a letter stencil that um, is white enough for, sorry, white enough for the adding. But anyway, let's put that things on and uh, have a look how they fit. Well, I guess they don't look too bad. Uh, yeah, there's room for improvement, I guess. Uh, I could have made these a little bit bigger and then, not that I had them, I could have used a bigger stencil that might accommodate uh, a bigger adding or that size adding uh, but anyway that's it for now and uh, it's time to close up the whole thing so here it is the finished product range switches for the analog instruments 10 turn port yeah I like that one, <clears throat> the power indicator. Yeah, it took me long enough and yeah, the bag. Big enough heatsink, IC connector, fuse holder, old holes don't stick anything inside them, uh, you might get a shock.
Yeah. So, finished that little project. Now I have at least uh, <laughs> one working power supply, even if it's not a full lab power supply. But uh, it will be helpful in finishing my main vintage power supply restoration project. Okay, that's it for now. Bye. This is a really big capacitor and it's going down nice and controlled. No spike here on switching off because the negative auxiliary rail is working perfectly as a charge pump, voltage doubler, whatever.